a 35 year old male with a known case of diabetes type 1 presents to you with the complaints of nausea, vomiting, diffuse abdominal pain and he doesn't look good on the presentation right and also he is in altered mentation. So what do you think about this patient and how do you manage this particular patient? So yes, uh, you can see in the title itself, this is about a diabetic ketoacidosis. And I'll talk everything about it, how these patients presents with, why these patients presents with these complaints, what are the investigation you need to send and how to actually manage or treat these patients, which is very, very important, right? To manage and to approach these kind of patients because uh, in the books, yes, you will read all of it, but how to actually approach whenever you see these patients, I'll let you know, right? So please see this video till the end. And I'm Dr. Chirag, critical care specialist. So I'll be talking about all the approach in these kind of scenarios. So whenever you need to approach any patient in your OPD, wards, emergency or ICU, the first and foremost thing you need to go with is to take a brief clinical history, right? Either from the patient if conscious or from the nearby relative. Now in this particular scenario, I'll be talking about, I'll ask the patient about the diabetes type 1 because these patients, diabetes type 1 are more predisposed to have DKA if you compare it with diabetes type 2, right? And as you all know, diabetes type 1, there is insulin deficiency because of the beta cell destruction, right? So diabetes type 1, I'll ask about uh, since how long the patient has this diabetes type 1? What is the treatment treatment patient is taking? What are the type of insulin the patient is taking? And how, uh, how compliant is the patient with that treatment? And lastly, how is the glycemic control? Whether the sugars are maintained or not, right? And whether the patient is checking regularly the sugar levels or the HbA1c, right? So this is the first thing I would like to ask in the history. Secondly, you need to ask about the current infection, right? So because these, any infection can precipitate or exacerbate your DKA, right? So and most common infection which precipitates is your pneumonia. So you will ask about any cough, sputum or any fever episodes, right? The second uh, infection which is common is UTI, urinary tract infection. So you will ask about burning micturition or the fever episodes. And there can be associated pancreatitis or cholangitis. So these also can precipitate. Thirdly, the other precipitating factor I would say is infarction. Mainly, it is the myocardial infarction or the heart attack or the ischemic stroke, right? So these can also precipitate. And then the abuse of drug, mainly the cocaine, it also exacerbates. So you need to ask the history about the drug abuse. And also the fifth, which is being mentioned also in the Harrison, I, I would quote Harrison over here, is the pregnancy, right? So these are the, the important things which you need to ask. Obviously, we will have a good history if you have the time and if the patient is not deteriorating. But these are the basic point which you need to ask. Secondly, now after taking a history, the second important is to have the clinical presentation of the symptoms and the clinical signs of the patient. Now. Talking about the clinical symptoms is the first and foremost patient has nausea and vomiting. And because of ketoacidosis, the ketoacids, they act on your CTZ in the brain causing nausea and vomiting. Along with that, the other symptom important is abdominal pain. Now this could be because of electrolyte imbalances. And particularly I will call it is the hypokalemia which can cause ileus and can, will be responsible or may be responsible for causing abdominal pain, right? Then along with that, uh, these patients are usually short of breath. Now this short of breath is because of acidosis in the body. I will talk about what is acidosis, what is small respiration in the later part of this video, right? So these uh, usually present with, can present with shortness of breath also. And the other symptom or the complaint which, can, which the patient can tell you is he or she is passing a, lot, uh, a good amount of urine that is polyuria and he is having a lot of thirst that is polydipsia. So he tries to drink more. So polyuria and polydipsia, right? So this is the clinical presentation or the clinical symptoms which the patient has. Along with that, you need to have the physical examination or the clinical examination of the patient and see the signs. 
the first important i would say in this is the dehydration very 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 important the first thing important in the dk is the dehydration right now i'll talk somewhat about the pathophysiology in dk as the name says diabetic ketoacidosis uh, there is uh, insulin deficiency and that uh, causes stimulation of counter regulatory hormones which are your catecholamines the epinephrine not epinephrine and also uh, the glucagon so the, these causes excess of glucose in the body by pushing the liver to have that gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis right so there is intense hyperglycemia in the body now this hyperglycemia this increased sugar load when it goes to the kidney it takes it pulls the extra water along with it and it is expelled out of the body causing dehydration very 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 important right so uh, the signs and symptoms obviously you will see the skin turgor so you will see the skin is going back very slowly the skin turgor secondly you can see tachycardia on the monitor or just palpate the pulse there is a tachycardia the blood pressure is on a low side and if there is a catheter attached or uh, there is a foley's bag then you can see the color of urine is very dark now the other sign is tachypnea or i would say a small respiration now why does this happen in this dka uh, i talked about the counter regulatory hormones right the norepinephrine epinephrine and glucagon what they do is they they stimulate the lipolysis in the body causing free fatty oxidation and producing ketone bodies now we have three important ketone bodies one is acetone second acetoacetate and third beta hydroxybutyrate and these two are very important and are the keto acids so keto acid means they are acidic in nature causing ph to go low with less than 7.3 now because of this decreased ph what your body does is it tries to compensate and try to maintain the ph in the range right so your body will wash out the co2 and to wash out your co2 you need to hyperventilate and that is the reason patient has a increased respiratory rate right so uh, so and this particular breathing pattern and the rate it is considered it is called as cosmol's breathing and the acetone which i just mentioned it causes fruity smell to the uh, to the breath right so there is a fruity odor to the breath now the so first i talked about the dehydration the signs of dehydration second the tachypnea or the breathing pattern and also check the abdomen of the patient there might be abdominal tenderness which mimics pancreatitis and the fourth is check the sensorium of the patient because of acidotic nature uh, there is separation of the gcs or the sensorium of the patient and there can be cerebral edema associated with it although cerebral edema is usually in the pediatric age group now talking about the investigation part first and foremost thing you will check is the blood sugar of the patient and if it is usually more than 250 mg per deciliter or more than 13.9 millimoles per liter secondly uh, you will have a check on the abg arterial blood gas analysis in that the ph is usually less than 7.3 then only you will say yes this is a dka right the other is you need to check a bicarb level also which is mentioned as less than 18 millicolins per liter so i would quote harrison over here because there is a controversy some book says and some guideline says uh, less than 15 but yes harrison says less than 18 millicolins per liter and i consider harrison as the bible of medicine right and the third important investigation is i would say it is the urine rm or the serum ketone levels right so uh, urine rm you will see uh, there are ketone bodies 2 plus or 3 plus whereas the best is to send a serum ketone bodies level and mainly it is the beta hydroxybutyrate which is being measured right then the next important the fourth important investigation is have a look on the serum electrolytes uh, all all of it the sodium potassium chloride magnesium phosphate but out of them the most important is the sodium and potassium right and sodium in these conditions are called as having a pseudo hypernatremia whenever there is a hyperglycemic state so uh, the sodium reduces by 1.6 millicolins per liter whenever there is a rise of 100 mg per deciliter of sugar right so you need to correct it and the other is potassium obviously whenever there is a acidotic state in the body what happens is the 
the H plus that moves into the cell whereas the K plus that moves out of the cell because of your H plus K plus pump. And it looks like, yes, the potassium is out, outside in the plasma. It looks like there's a hyperkalemia state, but these cells are actually devoid of potassium. Right? So you need to have a look on potassium, very, very important. Otherwise, it can cause uh, arrhythmias, which can be lethal to the patient. Right? After that, uh, the next thing you need to have a look on the urea and creatine. Because as I just mentioned about the dehydration, these patients uh, are very prone to have that pre-renal AKI. Right? So you need to have a look on the urea and the creatinine. So these are the basic investigations which you should send the patient whenever you are suspecting DKA. Along with that, if you have a suspicion of infection, let's say you are, you are thinking in terms of pneumonia, so just get, get a chest x-ray done. Or if you are thinking in terms, it, if it is mimicking with a pancreatitis, just send serum amylase and lipase also. Because in DKA, amylase is usually raised. So to be very specific, send serum lipase along with it. Right? And still, if the doubt persists or your suspicion is very, very high, you can go ahead with CT abdomen for the pancreatitis to rule out the pancreatitis. Right? Then, uh, obviously, if uh, you think, yes, uh, the sensorium is involved, you, need, you can go ahead with CT head of the patient just to rule out whether it is just cerebral edema or any other thing. And talking about the most important part, the most critical part of this uh, session or about the DK is the treatment. How do you manage? How do you treat these patients? Now, as this is a state which causes dehydration, intense dehydration in the body, the first important step is to rehydrate or replace the fluid even before you start insulin. So don't just see the glucose. It is 400, 500, 600. It is very high. You start insulin. No, not done. The first, this is a contracted state. The volume status is contracted, right? So you need to replace the fluid first. The first step is always give fluids. And the fluid which is preferred is the crystallite and that to 0.9% normal saline, right? So you start at, uh, you give two to three liters over one to three hours, right? So initially in the one hour, you give at 20 ml per kg. So one liter, just remember, give one liter in one hour or maybe two liters in one hour, right? So this is how you need to manage depending on the clinical status. Or obviously, you need to see the heart rate, the, the, the urine output, everything in the patient. So this is how you need to start it. And also after starting this fluid, then you need to have a check on the serum electrolytes. If the sodium is uh, on a lower side, yes, you can continue with 0.9% saline. But if it is on a higher side or chloride on a higher side, then change the fluid to 0.45% normal saline or it is called as N by 2, right? And if your sugar, it comes less than 250 milligram per deciliter, then change the fluid to dextrose containing fluid, either DNS or DN by 2, right? After the fluid replacement, obviously you need to give administer insulin to the patient and this is given in IV form. And uh, as a bolus, as a, in a dose of 0.1 unit per kg, followed by infusion of 0.1 unit per kg per hour, right? And obviously you need to titrate it according to the blood glucose level. So you need to have a continuous intense monitoring of all these things, the vitals, the sugar, the electrolytes, everything, right? The urine output, everything. So these patients are being managed in the ICUs. Now, now after taking care of the fluid replacement, Insulin, the third important is to have a look on the electrolytes, right? You need to replenish. Now, if your potassium, serum potassium is less than 3.3 milliequivalents per liter, do not give insulin to the patient. Do not. It will be lethal. Why? Your insulin, if you give insulin to these patients, hypokalemic patients, it will cause movement of potassium from outside to inside the cell. It shifts the potassium inside the cell, causing more hypokalemia, which can cause arrhythmias, and it is lethal to the patient. There can be even cardiac arrest, right? So please first take care of the fluid and also take care of the electrolytes. And if the potassium is a five, around 5 to 5.2, then just give 10 milliequivalents per hour. And if it is very low, as I just mentioned, less than 3.3, you need to give 40 to 80 milliequivalents per hour and first replenish take the potassium more than 3.3 or more than 3.5, then start the insulin. And our goal for uh, glucose is 150 to 200 milligram per deciliter, right? So you need to maintain that. 
uh, apart from that this was all about the decay the other thing which i need to just mention take a minute for it is the other entity which is called as hhs hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state right whenever your ph is more than 7.3 and bicarb is more than 18 milliequivalents per liter then yes it is it can be hhs or the other variant or i would say the other thing which is being mentioned nowadays is euglycemic decay right this is very very typical of sglt2 which are the gliflozins which we are commonly prescribing for the diabetic patients right so these causes euglycemic decay very important for your mcq and also clinically also so this was all about decay and i hope you loved this video and you understood something about how to manage how to approach these kind of patients if yes please leave your feedback in the comment section below i i mean it's not just yes if no also just leave your comments in the comment section below okay bye bye take care